Um, hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to today's panel. Uh, we will be discussing the, uh, the many challenges uh, of the cost of touring, that cost being uh, not just financial for the labels, but also physically for the artists, um, and uh, a number of challenges around hidden ticket fees, uh, fewer gig workers post-pandemic, um, higher expenses traveling on the road, um, and health issues and health requirements. So I am joined today by an expert panel that will introduce themselves shortly. Unfortunately, we've had uh, apologies from Evelyn, who is due to join us. She works for Reaper Barn, but unfortunately and ironically, she couldn't make it due to um, transport and travel challenges. So um, we will valiantly move ahead and I will ask our expert panel in order to introduce themselves and let us know why they're here talking about this topic. Yeah, all right, need to start. Yeah, um, my name is Richard Hannon and I run uh, Big Indie Records. I'm the vice president, which is actually an Austin-based record label. But I've toured the world and I've done shows from Sydney down to... Tokyo right through to St. Petersburg and, and everywhere in between. So I've got a history of touring and that goes back many years, probably about 20 years. But now with the new role, Big Indie is a record label, music publisher. We also have a music magazine, which is very good. And we also do live events. Hi, my name is Felicia Rizzolo. I work at Epitaph and Anti Records as a marketing director. I spent 10 years doing tour marketing, spending a lot of time with promoters and agents, and working on visas for touring artists around the world. So, I've seen a lot from both sides. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pete Smolin. I'm an artist manager. I have a company called Upward Spiral Music, and we represent They Might Be Giants and OK Go and the Stung Foxes and a handful of other artists who do lots and lots of touring. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Matt, and uh, I run a company called Artist Growth, and we're a software company. Um, I spent probably the whole decade of my 20s touring as an independent, you know, with different bands and as an independent singer songwriter, and started Artist Growth in 2012 uh, initially as, a, as an application for artists to manage the business side of things on the road, and that's grown over the last 10 years. We now work with most of the major labels, indie labels and management firms in the US, um, or at least portions of them. And um, we're very, very focused on providing tools to make it way more streamlined on the road and um, very focused on doing deals and, and creating partnerships that our customers can benefit from that drastically reduce the cost of touring and doing business uh, across the board. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Morgan, and I'm head of artist partnerships at DICE. DICE is a ticketing company and discovery platform. And my job on the artist side is to use our tools and our data to help artist teams with their life plans. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Morgan. Um, and I'm Sylvia Montello. I'm the recently appointed CEO of AIM, which is the UK equivalent of A2IM. Um, I've worked in music for over 30 years, um, worked at major and independent labels, and worked directly with lots of uh, developing mid-range and senior level artists, uh, both from the UK and internationally. Um, and I'm delighted to, uh, to be moderating this panel. Um, we will leave a few minutes at the end for any Q&As. Um, but let's now dive in and start. So um, firstly, I'd like to kick off by asking everybody, what do you think is the number one challenge being faced in the artist touring space right now in 2023? Open to anyone to kick off. Competition, too much traffic, every band in the world trying to tour all at the same time. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very hard to sell tickets unless you're a name artist and a, and a high demand show. I agree. I think everyone, obviously we're still in a pandemic, but the height of it, people thinking that everyone needs to be on the road right now because they've not toured for two years, which is really not the case. There's tons you can be doing without going on the road. And I think it's just way too difficult out there. Everyone wants to go out between September and November in the States, and it's just not realistic. <laughs> you need to pull back a little bit. You don't have to go out there. Morgan? Yeah. Um I love what you guys are saying. I mean, it's so true. Um, from a fan perspective, what we've noticed is a lot of late buying patterns. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, that's a big thing that we think about a lot um, that seems to be post-pandemic, but also affected by other factors. Um, we're seeing a lot of shows sell out later. And that um, causes a lot of problems for artists, for margins, for financials. Um, and we've, you know, when I speak to agents and I speak to labels and I speak to artist teams, um, it seems to be a trend across the board. So that's, that's a big one that um, I thought about. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, well, I mean, essentially, it's spiraling costs, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. your accommodation has gone up. I mean, in Europe at the moment, like, fuel is 16 bucks a gallon. Here it's, what, five, six? I mean, it's insane. So, you, you, you know, you're just trying to get out there on the road. And it, obviously, it all depends on the level of artist you are. And if you're a heritage, heritage artist and you've got many things going on, you've got a big audience, you can kind of move through it. I guess the emerging artist is where it's really difficult right now and, and making sure they can get on the road effectively and cost effectively. Yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. So I think certainly I think post uh, COVID and all those issues we had, I think that I think it's just the mere cost across everything, the tour buses, the, the staff, the crew, everything has gone up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, do you have anything else to add, Matt? I mean, I would, I would echo, I think, cost is a big thing. Demand and competition is huge. I guess something that hasn't been mentioned that I think is also a challenge um, is just getting access to really good actionable data to be able to really have a plan about where you should tour and when, you know, to maximize the return on your investment to go out because it is a real investment, time and, and money and resources. And so um, I think that's a challenge, you know, and, and everybody kind of has like the their routings that they've always done and they can rely on, but, but discovering new opportunities and, and new strategies around how to do it right and well, it really effectively requires data and uh, industry-wide, we still struggle with a lot of data being siloed. And so it makes it hard for operators to, to leverage it to make good decisions. Okay, thank you. Um, and quickly, um, is there also a challenge that you're seeing around venues having closed in various territories because of the pandemic? So those have actually kind of gone out of business, meaning that there's less opportunity maybe for some of those developing artists. Is, is that something that, that is affecting your businesses or not so much? I can't think of a specific one offhand, but there's definitely been instances routing a tour where there isn't that 250 cap room anymore or a 500 cap room that it just it's not there and there's no place to go and you just skip the city mm -hmm. you know move on so yeah definitely okay um and everyone's mentioned that you know the challenges post pandemic um do you all agree that 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 the challenges you've mentioned are heightened versus pre-pandemic and if that's the case, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see a point where you think things are going to settle or, or improve again? Um, maybe start with Morgan and, and work Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are starting to see things get better, even though it could feel um, it's gloomy sometimes. Um, obviously, 2020 was a very special year, and so was 2021. So we're still feeling the, the impacts of those times, but um, there are less lockdowns and there are less mandated health requirements. So 2023 is the first year, I believe, where we haven't had any mandatory lockdowns yet and where health requirements have eased up for long periods of time, where it makes everybody in the industry feel a little bit better about planning ahead. Um, so, you know, for us at DICE, 2022 was our biggest year ever. Um, we are seeing people wanting to go out more and people wanting to reconnect physically, especially, um, especially as a result of isolation during the pandemic. Um, I do see a light at the end of the tunnel and it feels like things are trending in the right direction. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, we don't, I, I don't have too much line of sight, like I'm directly on venues and, and ticket sales and things like that in our business. Um, one of the things we do see is the, is the cost of touring and the cost of doing live. And while I do think there will be some normalization when supply chain issues and just the cost of goods and everything starts to come down, even with that though, I think the costs of doing business on the road are gonna to continue to rise and, and stay really high for a while. And so that, that is one of the challenges we're laser focused on at my company is, is doing deals and partnerships so people can get drastic reduction in costs in hotel rooms and fuel and all the things you spend money on on the road. And so from that point of view, the work we're doing and, and some other companies I'm aware of, 
I think it's going to really help. So I, I think the light at the end of the tunnel is that, that we're bringing opportunities forward that will help artists lower that cost, even though it still remains pretty high, and it probably will for a while. Okay. Pete? Um, <clears throat> and one of the biggest issues we found when They Might Be Giants went back on the road was bus availability. It was impossible. Mm -hmm. That seems to have eased now a little bit. Uh, and then crew staffing was brutal. <laughs> half my crew didn't want to go back on the road anymore. Right. The other half didn't want to work for the rates they were working at before. Um, and so it's taken a long time to rebuild that. And some, pe some people I've hired have gone out on the road and go, you know, I don't want to do this. Like, this isn't good for me. I can't be on tour for three weeks. It's just, it was too much, too much stress on their lives. And they quit, you know. So, like, that, I, th I think it's eased. I think there's a new group of people who are coming in. Um, younger people who want to work on the road and do those kind of jobs. Um, they all want to be paid more than the guys who came before them did. So, I mean, that has been a financial issue for us, but you, know, you got to pay, you know? Okay. Felicia, your thoughts? Yeah, I think pre-pandemic, we weren't even having these conversations, so I'm happy that we're happy having these conversations about things cost a lot of money. It's really hard mentally for these artists to go out on the road. Um, just talking about it more openly, I think, it lets the fans in too a little bit more. I think fans are more receptive of like, oh, okay, my artist didn't just cancel because uh, you know, they didn't want to come for whatever reason. It's like, no, things are really expensive and it's really hard to be out there. Like we can't, you know, we can't just do the same things that we did pre-pandemic. So I'm just happy that the conversations are happening. Even, even if it's difficult. <laughs> That's what I got. Yeah, PA systems as well. I we think we need to update them. Um, I, I think the thing is, it's about the future, right? So it's yeah. about where we go from where we've been. And now it's data-driven. And I think that's the key. I think if you're really going to make sense of touring, I think you kind of really have to look at where you're going, what you're doing there, check your audience. I mean, we do things like we see spikes on Shazam or something. And then we think, okay, all right, we know there's an audience there. So that audience is now targeted. So pre pandemic we probably did less of that but I think now we're really trying to dive into the data and some of the guys here they are specialists in that data and that collection and they have from doing many tours that useful information so I think you've got to work with your team and if you work with your team and they have that you know it's worth doing if you're going to do a tour of 50 dates but only 10 of them are making sense just do 10 don't do the 50 because then you're really at the end of it you're, you're really not going to make anything you think you're going to go to some city and think okay i'm going to head down there it's a new audience going to play in front of five people it does you no good it does you no good for the artist either the, the kind of welfare of the artist is really important but i also think that you check out beforehand where you're getting your spikes and you can see those cities it all depends obviously if it's a big heritage act again they, they're on a different level the level I'm working at, which is going from emerging artists up to kind of mid-range, I mean, we're very specific in what we're trying to do. We work very closely with the agents, very closely with the promoters, so that we don't mess things up and just spend money sort of aimlessly. Oh, fantastic. I mean, that's, that's brought me nicely onto the next question where, you know, we've been talking a lot about the challenges, but, you know, what are some of the solutions that, that you and your companies can provide to help mitigate against these kinds of challenges. So again, love to hear any sort of specific examples or general examples from each of you. Yeah, I can go first. Um, for us, there's a few things. I mean, it, it definitely starts with the fan experience. So, you know, creating an app experience and purchasing experience that's as seamless and fun for fans to want to buy tickets. Um, that, that's one of DICE's primary goals. And then um, on the artist side, specifically with my team, um, well, firstly, with, with the tools we have, um, with the, the, the DICE um, tools that we've created, you know, like reminders, like waiting lists, um, like event saves, there's a lot of things that help us measure demand and help us share data with artist teams to kind of look at how, you know, have a, have a look at how things are feeling and looking before really making that commitment. Um, my team specifically is more uh, a human touch where um, we, we offer expert consultancy based on our experience. And then, you know, we use the data and make sense of it and make recommendations to artist teams. Um, you know, we think this market would be really good for you and we think this room would make a lot of sense. So we do that um, with artists, um, small and large, all the time. 
Um, and yeah, it, um, it's one of the ways that we try to help. Great, thank you. Matt? Yeah, so um, one of the good things about being a software company is you can serve a whole lot of people and, you can, and so you can, you can start to operate at a certain degree of scale which gives us the opportunity to go to brands and, and other businesses and sort of negotiate on behalf of everybody that we work with. And so we've been doing that at Artist Growth and um, we're testing, we're, we're probably gonna, this summer, maybe July, early August, we're gonna launch it publicly, but like we built a platform that um, is part of our management application um, where you can get discounts on everything from like tour bus rentals, hotel rooms, um, gas, car rentals, food, gear, uh, I've been using it for the past couple of months when I travel um, for business, and I've been saving on average like two to two hundred fifty dollars a night per room um, on hotels. Right, so if you're if you're going out with a band and a tour manager and any kind of crew, like that starts to add up into the tens of thousands really fast. And so for us, you know, our goal is like, you know, our core product is here's a tool to help your team stay on the same page and manage things better. But bolted onto that is you could save tens of thousands, or depending on the size of your act, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, you know, and the majors, they have deals like, you know, so they can cut a deal with Delta, they can cut a deal with Hilton and say, okay, every one of our artists and staff are gonna get booked through a travel agency and we're gonna get 30% off all of this stuff. If you're an indie label or a boutique management company, like you don't have that kind of scale to go to these brands and say, hey Delta, give us, give us a discount on flights. And so what we're trying to do is build that on behalf of the sort of independent community and say, now you can have the same kind of access to discounts and stuff to bring the cost of business down that, that some of the larger uh, corporate entities have, which is really exciting for us. I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna move the needle for a lot of people. Mm. That Sign sounds fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Pete. Um, I think what Richard was saying about smart touring mm -hmm. and not just taking every opportunity because it was presented to you and not doing the sort of tour where you go out and you do a month on the road playing to 10 people a night just because you have a record out or something. like It has to be planned and, and thoughtful and um, it has to make sense. You have to have some evidence that you're gonna go into a city and there's people who are gonna come to the show. For me, my company is independent. My artists are almost exclusively independent. We don't generally have record labels who are supporting us. We have to do it on our own. And it's, it's very hard to find um, that balance between sustainable touring and backbreaking touring, you know, and, and I, like, I don't. I, I have artists who have done the backbreaking touring, mm -hmm. and they will not do it again. <laughs> and for me, it's. It, I think they're relieved when I say we don't have to do that. It doesn't matter if we do that or not. Why go to Houston and play for five people? There's no point. You know, let's let's spend the time and the money and the effort doing something else that can engage the five people who are in Houston without you going there. There's other things to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I want to piggyback off that too. I think we're not talking enough about strategic touring. Um, you don't have to go out for 60 days just because your record came out two weeks ago. Um, it's just not smart anymore. It's not, it's not helpful for anybody. People don't have the money for all that. Um, and I think people are forgetting a lot about the local community and indie record stores. Like, not every band uh, who's from California can just tour the West Coast playing all these venues. Maybe there's a couple of record stores that you can do in stores with and it supports that community. You're building more and record stores wanna bring people in and even if it's a local artist where you're growing in, bringing product in, you're signing product for them to have. I think we're just forgetting about that side of it and thinking about the venues and I think we all know, you know, venues, everything costs more money, alcohol, everything. So it's like, let's go to a free space. You're having a community there and it's gonna start a rapport even as a really small artist. I think we're not doing enough of that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think my perspective is, I think it's gotta be meaningful. Mm -hmm. I think that is the whole thing. So what we try and do is just to do a tour, like, yeah, why? You know, we try and do it with the radio guys, the publicity guys. We make sure that we communicate everything at once so if there's something going out, then we gotta make sure that at that, sign, at that same time we're communicating the release, that that goes in conjunction with the dates. And when we're doing those dates, we gotta make sure that we got the next dates in line. So that every time you're doing this, you're building it. And that's the thing, you gotta produce you know, a method, a way of moving forward that is constantly building. And it's a slow build, especially if you're starting at the beginning, 
right? But the, uh, but just to go out there, it's it's it has to be meaningful, and meaningful means using your team, using your team, so that everybody is going out there and working it at the same time as the tour, so it's not done separately. And if you can, if you can manage that and bring everyone in together, I think you're going to have a strong sort of like push forward, you know. Great, thanks everybody. Um, I'm going to come on to a, uh, a thorny topic now, which is uh, a, a, on a lot of people's minds, which is the uh, US visa ch uh, cost changes um, and general changes there. So there's, I know there's been a lot of debate in the US, but also very much outside of the US um, about, uh, you know, the, the cost challenges in particular for overseas artists. Um, there, were, there was a campaign that you may be familiar with called Let the Music Move, which was instigated out of the UK. And that highlighted a 250% uh, increase to touring visas fees. So what are your views on this change? Um, and be as honest and open as you like. Can I start with that one? Of course. <laughs> I, think, I think the thing is, again, it's, it's another thing. It's another cost. I run a label that is based in London and based in Austin. So I get a full view of the international guys when they come in the country and the US guys wanted to go out, right? It's so complex that there is no one way to really figure this out. I did a, I did a few shows down in, in Mexico the other day. We rode over the border, right? And we went there and paid 10 bucks. This band wasn't big. We could do it for a little visa on the, you know, hey, there is ways. Hey, by the way, that's not advice for everyone. <laughs> I just say. <laughs> but when you're doing the bigger tours and then certainly like, there is ways to kind of mitigate the costs. If you're doing, if you're bringing international artists and you're doing something like South by Southwest, then you don't actually need a visa. So there's things, you know, you can come in if you're an international artist and bring them in. If you're a record label here in the US and you're bringing in, you're signing international artists and they're part of that sort of Esther um, agreement with the US, you can bring them in and showcase in this country without having a visa. So that's a tip, that will save you a lot of money. Great. Right? Um, there is a guy running around here at the moment, Matthew Covey. He's absolutely excellent at this. He, there is a charity organization called Tam Is That, and Tam Is That help international artists come into this country and they work it out. So that is a way of reducing the cost. He also has, uh, well, you guys probably know Matthew, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's superb. He's he also great. helps US artists go out of the country too. Great. But um, yeah, I mean, those, those are the kind of things I would be using. Fantastic. That's a great tip. Um, Felicia. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I've worked with Matthew before yeah. on a ton of visas, and he's a really great guy. And just everything about that organization has been super helpful. So I second that completely. I mean, the cost of visas are just so <laughs> astronomical and ridiculous that I tell artists, like, if we're not in a place to give you enough tour support to come out here, don't come in debt to come to another country. It's not worth it. There are so many other things we can be doing in the meantime to raise your profile and get you bigger so that when you do come here and you do, you know, have a big cost to come out here, it's going to be worth it because you're going to be playing bigger venues versus coming out here on a visa and you're playing 200 cap venues and they're half full. It's just not worth it. Like we're in a different time. You can't do those same games anymore. It's just not the same, same climate. So. Thank you. Um, Pete, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't know if enough, enough about federal policy to know where that money is <laughs> intended to go, but I'm sure they can get it from someplace else <laughs> yeah, besides right. artists. Who have no money. Yeah. Oh, no. That's all. I would say don't tax them at all. Yeah, I kind of second that. I, I think it's, you know, it should be more friendly to the artists for sure. Um, yeah. But again, this is, this is a thing like I think educational resources and, and access to the information and the data is, is critical, right? So people have a place they can easily go and access the information that's gonna help them build a P&L and know whether or not they should even do it, right? And are artists building P&Ls before they start booking shows? Like, I don't know, they should be. And so, I, you know, but it's, if, if you're, especially if you're a younger artist, like, you, you tell an artist to build a P&L and it, you might as well be speaking Chinese. At least that's how it was for me when I was touring and self-booked, right? It's like, I wasn't building P&Ls, I was just hmm. trying to get in front of fans and running in the red, you know? a lot and so I think access to data and education is really really key to help people be like look here it is this is a template for you start plugging in numbers and then decide what's worth it and what's not and try to be really really strategic and smart 
No, that, that makes sense. Um, I mean, I just wanted to bring in an example from, um, from some UK artists that I've been speaking to about the, the US visa application. And it's not just about the cost, but actually they were finding just the challenge of the length of time it was mm, taking. Yeah. And even the ones that had actually come up with a P&L in terms of what their travel and accommodation, by the time the visa came through, those costs had gone up two or three times. Right. So their P&L was blown out of the water right. through no fault of their own. And those, those are the ones that are actually planning some yeah. things. So yeah. wow. the, the length of time um, and you know this artist you know, one of the artists happens to be a, a person of color with an obviously non anglo American name and we do wonder whether there's also um, a, a different length of time in terms of some of those visa applications going through than there would be otherwise so a few challenges around that I I'll think. just say too especially when you the, the cost of a regular visa versus expedited is unbelievable and so if you Obviously, you don't want to have to pay those expedited fees, so it's really planning in advance as much as possible. I mean, it's nearly double sometimes. It's unreal. And, you're, and that's not even guaranteeing you're going to get an appointment at the embassy. It's unbelievable. But I heard that was an extra kind of $2,500 yeah. to expedite. Oh, yeah. So the people that are winning here seem to be the lawyers, right? <laughs> Can I add a little tip again? I like my tips. <laughs> Good, go for there it. Is, there is a way, like, if you're touring internationally and you're coming out of the U.S. and you go in and touring and you're in, you're in Australia, you're doing Japan, wherever, right, maybe, if artists get to that level, you can get two passports. Mm -hmm. So, like, this, so the issue you're talking about, which is the time length to get the visas done, it can be ridiculous. And each country does it differently. It's a minefield. That's why you need experts. Mm -hmm. But that said, you can apply as a professional in the music industry for two passports. Yes, equally in, in the UK, but also here in the US. And do you, do you need sponsorship from anybody on that? or? Um, yeah, you would need some like letters of invitation, I yeah. think they call it. Mm -hmm. Uh, some sort of like if, if you're yeah you would know by your promoter you would speak to them they'd give you some information if you're doing Japan and they, they and you're also doing Australia or something it's all very tight you could get some information some paperwork and you'd have to submit that I mean they, they, they don't give them away easily mm -hmm. it's it's not just hey take two <laughs> yeah. are, you, are you talking about a passport from another country or no, two no, no, no. You US have, passports? No, you have two U.S. passports. So and the reason why, that there's actually multiple reasons for having this, but one of them, you might be touring in a country that has issues, and therefore you can't get into another country. So that's one reason. The other reason potentially could be just time factors to get these. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, you're, if you're touring in Indonesia and you've got to go to Europe, you know, the, the time factor, Europe might be really quick, to turn it around, but Indonesia probably won't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've experienced all of that dropping off a pile of passports at, uh, yeah. at a consulate uh, 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 yeah. and wondering how long it'll take till I get them back because yeah. the band's got to go someplace else. Exactly mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, ha we had a conversation um, with, within the trade associations yesterday about this issue, and one of the ideas we were discussing was whether actually trade associations could play a part in helping with those letters of recommendation, which we do in the UK, mm. especially for uh, artists that are uh, coming in from Africa or other places where they have to apply for a visa. Sometimes just actually having that recommendation from a government recognized authority can help to expedite without the extra cost. So that's something else that perhaps can be in place. Uh, Morgan, did you have anything that you wanted to add on the, the US um, visa side? Uh, yeah, no, that's really interesting. It comes up a lot. Um, well, just on behalf of myself, not DICE, and um, yeah, I think, you know, cross-cultural pollination is key to cultural heritage. So if you look at every music genre, everything in music benefits from traveling beyond borders and growing ideas. So I would love to see governments be more supportive of that. Fantastic, thank Agreed. you. Um, so, given all the economic challenges we're talking about with touring, um, I know certainly in the UK we're hearing more and more labels now being asked to provide more and more tour support mm -hmm. where it may not be within the contract with their artist and they may not be able to actually uh, find that extra budget. Do, do you think that the labels should be contributing more or do you think that... Um, those costs should be covered from elsewhere in the ecosystem. If you'd like to start with that. Start, yeah. I think firstly, people got to understand what tour support is, <laughs> right? Yeah. I yeah, mean, essentially, like, tour support is an advance on your own royalties. So you're not going to get paid. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you've got to pay that back first. So taking tour support is going to be considered for that. The good side is you're not really paying interest on that sort of, but, you know, essentially just be wise and understand what that is if you don't know what that is. Uh, we're a label. We, we sometimes give tour support. It all depends. So there was a, an artist that's done really well. He's gone gold in this country. And uh, we gave him 10,000 US dollars to help him tour. And, and that has helped out. And he went out and he bought a wagon and he went up and down on the road. So, you know, he used it wisely, right? Um, but also then you've got to think of the type of act and, and if that act really needs that. So we don't have it in every contract, but sometimes if an artist requests that, then we say, well, okay, well, then we, we, we can look at it. And it's always on sort of like mutual approval. So you can't, you know, they, they can't just kind of demand it. We, we, we also, uh, uh, something you may want to understand too, is that you generally, if you're giving out as a label, you're giving out tour support, you kind of want to see some paperwork from them. So you want to understand what the budget is. You want to understand what they're going to be spending this money on, you know, and if it's, you know, uh, essentially, so you kind of got to work with them, but we, we give out tour support. Great. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I do think as a label, we should be giving tour support. We can't always cover it. Yeah. Um, and I think what you're saying, you know, we need a budget breakdown, you know, is it going to be four hotels every night? Is it, you know, sometimes we've done before where we've given uh, tour support and it is, you know, a down payment on a van that they can eventually make the payments on their own. Like we'll do the first uh, year of payments, we'll pay for those and then you guys can take over the van payment. Something like that that's actually going to be helpful versus just getting a hotel every night, which, you know, that sounds really great and nice and will help them, but something like a van or a sprinter or something like that is going to take them a lot further. So. Thanks. Um, Pete? Well, I haven't had the pleasure of asking for tour support in a long time. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> as it often was. Uh, I've, I mean, for, for artists I've worked with, it's been helpful over the course of their careers. Um, it, it's allowed them to do a, a level of touring and get in front of larger audiences where, you know, opportunities to open for big bands where they were getting paid 250 bucks a night, which is just terrible. Um, and, you know, their shortfall was going to be fifty or $80,000. And the label paid for it. And I think everybody decided that was worthwhile for them and helped build their audience. To me, um, I think touring in, in the old music business sells records and it's part of it and it has to be part of the overall plan. And um, as long as everybody understands it's a recoupable cost. Um, and the goal here, it, it's a marketing expense. And if you want the artist to tour and promote the record that the label has paid for and, and is trying to sell, they need help to do it. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, so this is one that I've, I'm super interested in. So, you know, as, a, as again, as a software company, we, we provide services to labels and managers. And so we, we don't participate in those discussions between labels and managers who are asking for tour support and approving it, but we, we see it happening, right? And so we, we'll talk to a label and be like, tell us how you do it. And they'll say, well, you know, we tell the artist they have to give us a budget and then we either approve it or, or don't, or we shrink it down and approve less. and and then we just wire our money and, and it creates friction sometimes where like, well, you spent that on stuff that wasn't in your budget, you know, and there's, so we, we try to build tools that, that streamline the process and give people lots of control so there's less rub around doing it. A couple examples of that is, um, specifically with tour support is, we have a product now that allows, if a, if a label doesn't want to just wire somebody 50 grand, and they want to say like, okay, well, we'll give you five now and then 10. And if things are going well, and like, so they can actually do it on credit cards um, where they can control not only how much is on it at any given time, but where it will and won't work. So like I say, like this card's only going to run at a hotel or an airline. It's not going to run at a bar. It'll get declined, which, which makes things a little bit more streamlined. Um, and then another example is like trying to give artists other options where, so we did, um, William Morris Endeavor did an integration to our system to where now anytime the booking agent updates something in their internal system, it updates in our system automatically. So part of that data payload that comes over is what, what the guarantees are for the show. And so we now, so we started seeing like, look, these artists have shows in some cases booked out 18 months, 24 months, and there's signed contracts and they're getting paid, you know, $5,000, $10,000, 20. So I did a deal with the bank where we can now advance an artist up to like 50% of their future tour guarantees going out two years. So if you've got $500,000 that you're gonna make in the next two years, but you need 40 grand now because 
you got an opportunity to go to Europe and open for somebody, or you feel like you need to produce a video and your label's not giving you any money, like you can go, you can pull down some of that money, get that cash, and then just pay it back once you've done the shows and gotten your guarantees, and you just sort of like pay it back to to the bank. So it's a super friendly, like fast access to cash that takes the tour support conversation kind of off the table. It's just sort of like, and we don't we don't charge interest or anything like that. It's just like it's your money. We're just helping you get it early. And the bank's happy to do it because now they've got a new relationship with an artist and they can get to know that artist and offer them other services and stuff. So that's a way you can leverage software to try to like streamline things where there's a rub and give artists more options that are potentially more friendly than some of the other <laughs> traditional financial structures that exist. Great, thank you. That's amazing. You just blew my mind with that. <laughs> um, basically, bank loans covered by offer guarantees that for shows that already know. Yeah, that's that right. Already know are coming. We that's did amazing. a we did a pilot with ten of our customers and in a six week or six month period, and we loaned out a little under two million dollars. I think the smallest advance ask was was twenty five grand. The biggest was two hundred and fifty. All the artists did it multiple times. Um, the the time from the request for capital to have them having money in the bank was under forty eight hours, and. And the only underwriting metric that was utilized by the bank to make the decision was the data that came in from the agency and the tour guarantee. So like, no paperwork around tax returns, like none of this long six week process to underwrite a loan. It was like, boom, boom, boom. And they all paid back within, within three months. Like by the end of the pilot, almost all the advances we made had been paid back already. And so the bank loved it. The artists were like, holy shit, this is fucking amazing. I've never been able to get access to cash like this. And that's the kind of stuff where it's like, that's data, right? It's just, we did something creative when we realized we had access to data and it unlocked this whole other option for artists. You know, because another thing is like alternative to tour support is you go to the promoter and you're like, hey, I need an advance. <laughs> and, that, and that comes with all kinds of strings, right? It's like, oh great, now you're gonna play our rooms for the rest of your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, that, make, that shuts down options, right? And I've seen a lot of bands get stuck in a room in a market that they shouldn't have been in. They should have been in a different room that's more suitable to their audience and where they're at in their evolution. Mm -hmm. But because they took an advance from unnamed company, they were forced to play a room that wasn't right for them. And so they and their fans had a shitty experience, you know, and it's just, mm -hmm. that doesn't have to happen. That shouldn't have to happen. So, you know, that's where I think innovation and utilization of data and software can really start to play a real important role. Fantastic. That's super cool. Um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, we, we work with lots of different labels from indie to major, so there's a wide spectrum of label involvement with artists and with touring. Um, I love what Richard was saying when, when you were saying, I talk to promoters, I talk to agents, like, that, that, I love that. Um, tour support traditionally means money, and that's not to be overlooked, but there's different forms of tour support. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk to labels all the time because inevitably a tour is gonna get scheduled around an album release. You know, the most successful tours that we work with, the label's involved one way or another. Everyone's talking. Everyone's working on the success of the release, which involves the tour. So we, we see a lot of labels where <clears throat> they might not be able to financially support a ton if they're independent, but they're going to go and talk to us and say, hey, what rooms do you have for my artist? Or can we get a good offer? Or can we reduce some costs with this room? And, and we do try to facilitate those things. And oftentimes what it means for the label is that they can go back to their artists with solutions around live, not just recording and releasing the music, but also offering resource around live plans. So um, tour support comes in different forms and uh, we see a lot of indie labels get involved and we love that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and you know, obviously collaboration across the various parties involved in the tour is, is always gonna be great potential for finding good solutions and, and you know being able to mitigate against some of those challenges um i'd like to open out to any questions um before we wrap up so i think there's a roaming mic does anyone have any questions for our experts angela A shameless plug and a question and um, the shameless plug to anybody in the room and those of you on the panel who are signing is through our system i'm from music from ireland the export office for ireland the music export office and we have a touring bursary and um, that so our, our thing is we have an event we bring buyers 
Then we have the export office, so we support the artists to go to like South By and stuff like that. And the next step is if they get an agent at that event and that agent books a tour, they can then get flight and accommodation support, don't have to give it back. And it's designed so that the artists aren't losing out by constantly having to pay everybody back. So if you're signing artists and you know, sign Irish is artists, this, there's is my this famous. For you, uh, Irish artists come, uh, travel going anywhere travel. in the world. Okay, limited um, to Irish artists. So it's if an artist is Irish or living in Ireland, okay. they can access it. So that's my shameless plug. If you're looking at a US and an Irish artist, and they both sound the same, sign the Irish artist. Um, um, my and question. To, to that point as well, actually, I'm sorry, you have a question. Yeah, uh, my question, I suppose, was all the time we were talking about the trickiness of getting back on the road and the trickiness of touring is the added trickiness um, that artists are coming to us as the export office to try and help them find solutions for is the social responsibility for sustainability. And that, you know, where are the alternatives to touring when touring is hurting the planet? Um, so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. I've, I'm working in that area right now. I mean, it's so... I mean, this, you know, tricky, making profit and touring, it's so complex that the, the title of this panel just doesn't come anywhere near <laughs> the issues, right? Yeah. Bands want to do sustainability, and artists really do. It's not there at that level yet. And what's the other problem? Yeah, if you want to try it out, it's going to cost <coughs> you a lot of money. We know that the bigger bands can afford to do some stuff. You get bands like Coldplay, right? I mean, they've got kinetic floors, so the audience can jump up and down and it can create some power, and that's, that's great. But how does that affect you when you're doing 200, 300 capacity? And how about this? What if you want to do a sustainable tour, and that tour, you're looking at 20 venues, and you're figuring out that only three of them are even looking at it. How are they going to cha change if they can't afford to change? So, like, one of the things that I'm working on in Europe is to kind of do some rating system because we have laws in, in, in certainly in the UK, where there's, by a certain year, 2030, they've, they've got to have a certain reduction. So when you make a rating, so how about this? How about if you go into a venue and you could look at that venue beforehand, and that venue said one out of 10, it said this six is their, is their level. How about if you go to another venue that says eight? How about if you go to one that says one? You can choose your tour and you can choose your sustainability, but we've got to get there. We're not there yet. There's so much to add in this area. Um, straight out of this, uh, this week, I'm going to Glastonbury. I mean, I'm there for five days in a tent. Um, the thing is about Glastonbury, they're one of the places, there's a, um, Coachella as well, obviously, but some of these places, they're good. They're really working hard at it, but they're pockets. So to actually get a truck on the road, and part of the issue is this, if you're going to do a stadium full of people, right, that's one of the worst things. Because that's the state where everybody has to travel there. One of the biggest issues with sustainability is people traveling to these big venues. Yeah. Listen, hey, we all got to make money. And I, I understand that it's going to happen. And people's want for bigger venues is a thing. You obviously opened the subject here. Uh, one last point, right? Imagine if you could do one venue of 100,000. Or you could do 10 venues. If you could do 10, 10 venues, you would tour more sustainably. Yeah, that's, that's actually a, a really good point. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been on quite a few sustainability touring yeah. kind of panels as well. And, and really, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of it comes down to the audience travel, not just the band travel. Obviously, yeah. there are ways you can mitigate your climate impact, um, especially if you can travel by train or ground or other means rather than flying, which obviously doesn't help if you're trying to come to the US from the UK, unless you want to get a boat for a long time. But it's about the audience and it's about having venues, you know, trying to encourage more kind of, I suppose, localization so that your audience are traveling sustainably. Um, and on the festival front, I mean, you mentioned Glastonbury, who put on... Uh, you know, they, they really go the extra mile to encourage people to travel by coach, mm -hmm. to actually give the options of how that works, the options of how train travel is going to work, and then the sustainability at the festival in terms of using biofuels, um, you know, recycling and everything. You know, they, they, they are kind of a, a bit of a beacon in that space, and I think more festivals doing that. If you are going to have a big festival with lots of people traveling, that has to be part of the solution. Um, before we wrap up, did, did anyone else have a, a, a point to add here? Well, I mean, it touches on sustainability as, as well as just the economics of touring that some of the people are talking about, but I don't think nearly enough, which is like digital. 
And I, you know, so in technology, we're always looking like four or five, 10 years down the road and trying to see like where the trend arc is taking us and what's happening. And, um, you know, in the next three to five years, the, the term live streaming is, is going to go, it's going to be completely redefined because immersive experience in your home is going to become a thing. And it's not going to be just a two-dimensional, like I'm looking at a YouTube screen and watching somebody in their basement with a crappy camera, like playing music and I don't feel the same thing I feel live, like five, 10 years from now, it's going to be a different game. And so it's going to, you know, I tell artists and, and independent companies, I know the majors are already making massive seven, eight figure investments into this. And so this is why I know it's coming because the, the front line is pushing it there fast. And then you got companies like Apple and Google and Meta that are also making investments. And so when I'm talking to independents or directly to artists, it's like, you have to start planning your digital strategy for performing and connecting with your fans now. And that is gonna provide more data, which is gonna tell you and inform, it's not gonna replace the in-person experience, nothing will, I don't think, but I do think it's gonna change it yeah. because people are gonna start expecting, well, if I'm gonna leave my home and I am gonna come out, they're gonna start expecting a, a different kind of experience. It's not just like stand on a stage and perform for me, it's something more immersive. And so as all these things change, I really do think it's gonna make it more economical for artists to reach global markets. And at the same time, uh, you know, impact how often people are actually going out, you know? And so the, the whole thing is about to get shaken up. And if, if you don't see that coming, you know, tune into it quickly because it won't be 2024, it won't be 2025 when that really lands. But outside of that, like the world of connecting with fans and experiencing live music is going to change massively. That sounds like a very good point on which we can close today's panel. Thank you so much, everybody. Morgan, Matt, Pete, Felicia, Richard. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.